Hello. Greetings to all of our Pleasant Green parishioners and our listeners online. And uh, this is Minister Leonard Harris. Again, it is my pleasure and privilege uh, to share the Sunday School lesson, which is Lesson 5 out of our Fall Semester Faith Pathway Study Guide. This is for Sunday, October the 2nd, 2022. And our lesson number five, the unit title is Out of Slavery to Nationhood. Out of Slavery to Nationhood. And this Sunday's title is a protective family. Our devotional reading is from the book of Acts, verse uh, chapter 7, verses 17 through 29. Our background scriptures are Exodus, the first chapter, verses 15 through 22. And then the second chapter of Exodus, verses 1 through 10, and then 15 through 22. And our printed passage is Exodus, the second chapter, verses 1 through 10. And our key, ver- our key verse is... I'll be reading from the King James Version. The woman conceived and bare a son. And when she saw him, that he was a goodly child, she hid him three months. And that is the second chapter of Exodus and the second verse. And our lesson's aims are identify the deep injustices that imperiled Moses' life and prompted his family's clever and creative care for him. Empathize with the struggles of families today who find themselves in seemingly impossible situations due to brokenness and societal injustices. And last, address structural injustice on behalf of loved ones who are endangered. Our lesson for this Sunday uh, is not as, uh, well, I'll say, It doesn't have as many parts as some of our other lessons. This lesson only has two parts to it. Uh, It is defying social justice. Those are verses 1 through 4 from the second chapter of Exodus. And then our last section is a baby's cry. And those are verses 5 through 10 uh, out of the second chapter of Exodus. And so our two major parts of our lesson, defying social injustice and a baby's cry. And before uh, we begin to indulge into our lesson, uh, let us go before the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you. As always, you've blessed us with another opportunity for us to indulge ourselves into your word. And Father, we would ask that you would be the spiritual utterance, uh, the guidance, and the voice piece uh, for this lesson. And that you would reveal or unveil to us the things that you would have us to know and understand, and then 
as always, we pray that you would compel and convict us by your spirit that we would live out the things that we have learned that we might be lights in a dark and dying world. And we ask it all in the name of Christ and for his sake we ask it. Amen. So our lesson begins with a announcement uh, out of the first verse of the second chapter of Exodus. And uh, I'm going to read from the uh, NIV and uh, read these first four verses. And then we will uh, look at uh, what transpired ahead of these verses to give more validity and clarity to uh, what is actually being said. Uh, So uh, the first verse says, Now a man of the tribe of Levi married a Levite woman, and she became pregnant and gave birth to a son. When she saw that he was a fine child, she hid him for three months. But when she could hide him no longer, she got a papyrus basket for him and coated it with tar and pitch. Then she placed the child in it and put it among the reeds along the bank of the Nile. His sister stood at a distance to see what would happen to him. And so our first section of our lesson uh, tells us of the birth of a child and then it uh, gives us some circumstances or some certain adjustments that were made without foretelling why these types of adjustments or this uh, behavior, uh, why was this done? Is this a normal procedure when children are born? Uh, Is this some type of custom or tradition? Uh, So in order for us to grapple with or try and unravel why these types of uh, adjustments or why these uh, types of uh, uh, persuasions, uh, why were these performed? For what reason? We then would have to look at the verses ahead of chapter 2, uh, beginning in the first chapter of Exodus, and then it will bring forth insight into why chapter 2 starts out with this reading and these types of activities, Uh, and that will uh, give clarity to it. So we're going to uh, just briefly summarize what the uh, first chapter of Exodus says. And then, in your leisure, uh, you should read uh, the first chapter of Exodus, verses 1 through 22. And then um, uh, it will give uh, a better insight into why chapter 2 begins as it does. But in chapter 1, and we're summarizing uh, Joseph and all of his brothers and that generation. Uh, So we know that uh, Joseph's brothers sold him into bondage into Egypt. But Joseph rose to great stature. And uh, Joseph uh, served a high office uh, into the Pharaoh's house. 
and so we know that uh, Joseph uh, had gained favor in the Egyptian government and also had brought his brothers who sold him into bondage, also brought them uh, into Egypt and their offspring and Joseph, and they all fared well in Egypt. Uh, they, their families grew and they increased and they were a part of the wealth that Egypt had gained um, much of because of Joseph's ability to interpret a dream that was given to the ruler of Egypt. And so uh, we learned that they did well during the time of Joseph. But when Joseph and his lineage, Joseph and, well, not his lineage, but his immediate family, when they died, a new ruler rose up in Egypt, and he did not know Joseph. And he viewed the offspring of Joseph and his brothers, he viewed their people as a threat. He felt fearful of the Hebrews as they were increasing in number. And although the Hebrew people had not proposed a threat, they did not announce a threat, they didn't proclaim a threat, they were just people multiplying, as all people do, and they were just utilizing the gifts and the resources that God had given to them, which also was available to Egypt. But the new ruler, who didn't understand the background and the history of Joseph and his family, he feared these people because of seeing their abilities and seeing how strong they were in character and also in their ability to produce uh, what they, their needs were for themselves. And he began to become perplexed and uh, occupied with the thought that what if these people would ever come grow to the point where now there are so many of them and they link to a enemy of ours and then come against us. And because of his fear, instead of working with the Hebrews, instead of trying to learn of their ways, their morals, their standards, their belief, instead of entreating them because of his fear, he decided to inflict harsh, unjust societal practices against them whereas he could have in, involved them in what they were already a part of. But instead, he inflicted social injustices. And then his fear became so magnified that he began to try and remove his greatest fear among the Hebrews, the Hebrew male child. And therefore, as you read into the story, you will learn that there were some Hebrew midwives, and the Pharaoh <coughs> had sent out a decree. He first inflicted the Hebrews with taskmasters to rule over them, and then he increased their work uh, 
loads. And then he, he uh, made, um, uh, he established, like, he multiplied the amount of work that they were, uh, had to perform. Uh, and uh, he, he expected them to, with their increase, with the uh, extended demands, he wanted them to do this with rigor. Uh, he wanted to inflict harsh working conditions and he wanted to inflict extreme difficulties while at the same time demanding more. And then to take it even a step further, uh, he sent out a decree to the Hebrew midwives, uh, two that are mentioned in the text, uh, Sifra and Pua, and he told them that when the Hebrew women would be in delivery, that if it was a female child to let her live, but if it was a male child to kill the male child and cast it into the river. And uh, so he was fearful of other large groups of men uh, not knowing if they would be loyal uh, to Egypt, uh, especially with the new uh, directives that were sent out to make their existence even uh, a greater hardship. And so uh, to try to remove any retaliation, he said, kill all the male children. But the two Hebrew midwives feared God more than they did the Pharaoh, and they would not kill the male children. And so just as an overlay, as we look at the lesson, uh, as we get into uh, chapter 2 and begin our reading from verses 1 through 4, now it kind of gives us, it ushers us into why did the scripture open with this? What was the significance of uh, them identifying it was the birth of a son? And why did the mother have to hide the child for three months? Well, uh, what had the child done that required it needed to be hidden uh, from society for three months. And then why did she have to put the child in a uh, basket uh, and send it uh, away in hopes, send it down the bank of the Nile in hopes that someone would receive the child and hopefully bring the child up in the right manner. And so uh, as we're looking into this, uh, I, uh, I'm sure those that have read through the lesson realize that uh, this is the work of God in and on behalf of a people who are oppressed, not because of something they have done to someone outside of their nation status, but they were oppressed because of observation from the outside looking in to see uh, the wealth of the people, the strength of the people, that they were growing, they were increasing. And so uh, when we see this, we realize that even though they came up against harsh and difficult circumstances that God was still intervening and in behalf of the people realizing what was being done to them. And a lot of times uh, under suppression and oppression, we don't always see the hand of God moving and intervening in and of our or on our behalf. But here, God has brought forth the future deliverer. And when, we, when I say future, 
we recognize that as the child, and the child's name that we're speaking of is Moses. Moses the deliverer. Moses the chosen deliverer of God's people. And so God has heard the cry of his people and he has sent a deliverer. And the deliverer comes without observation. No one recognizes Moses as the baby in the reed basket. No one knows that this is the deliverer, but God. God has sent the deliverer. And so we see God intervening. And when we speak of the child, um, so that uh, we recognize uh, how God intervenes uh, even and in the process uh, of birth. Uh, here, um, when we uh, think of this, and I said Moses in the future, uh, Moses is identified to us as a baby 80 years later. Identified as a baby. But 80 years later, after the experience with the burning bush, Moses would be sent to Egypt to seek after the deliverance of God's people. And so, just so that we see the significance of the child, uh, there are many scriptures I would like to just address a, a couple uh, uh, one is out of Psalm 127 and the third verse. Psalms number 127 and the third verse. And it says, Behold, children are a heritage from the Lord. The fruit of the womb is his reward. So when we think about our children, when we think about children in general, uh, we are the stewards and we are the protectors of God's heritage. They are ours for a moment. But when they reach adulthood, they are always our children. But as it was in the beginning and at birth, they are the Lord's heritage. The scripture says the fruit, the offspring of the womb is his reward. And then uh, when we look again at the significance of uh, our children, um, I'm sure that uh, everyone is familiar uh, with, I lift this because the lesson tells us that it is suggested in the commentary that uh, when she uh, sent the baby off, uh, she was then, the baby was then encountered by Pharaoh's sister. And Pharaoh's sister was barren, but she, as the sister, the sibling of Moses, who was uh, in the rushes, uh, watching the welfare, watching what would happen to Moses, she appeared when the Pharaoh's daughter saw the basket with the baby in it crying, and as God would have it, she then intervened and said, would you have me to have a midwife to breastfeed the baby, to take care of the baby? And so the Pharaoh said, yes, and I will pay the midwife, to breastfeed the baby. I will pay the woman to nurture the baby. And we know 
that the woman that nurtured the baby was Moses' mother, Jacobed. Oh, I'm sorry, Jacobed. And she nursed her child. And scripture or the text suggests that it was probably the weaning period was probably two to three years. So two to three years, the mother of Moses nursed and nourished her baby. And there is a bond that takes place, and I'm sure all women understand and are aware of this, but there's a bonding that takes place in the breastfeeding, nurturing process. The mother is imparting herself, not just through nutrition and nutrients, but she is imparting herself, her character, into the child in the breastfeeding process. And so uh, even though Moses grew up 40 years later in Egypt, he grew up and the scripture tells us he came to himself. Uh, in the seventh chapter of uh, Acts, uh, the seventh chapter, and it, it is a part of our devotional reading, but uh, Acts 7, uh, 17 through 29, in your leisure, if you read that, you find that Moses came to himself because himself was embedded in him as a child through his mother. And in God's time, himself surfaced, and then he realized who he was and what he was and what he needed to do. And so uh, during that process there, there are other scriptures that uh, we should entertain uh, just as... Uh, focusing on uh, our children. Um, but because of Moses being the deliverer and then also being a prototype of Christ, the savior of the world who came to save his people from the sins of the world. And so uh, when we look at uh, both, they both appeared as children and both of them were under the threat of being killed by evil, deceptive rulers. Moses had to flee the dwelling of the Hebrews so that his life would be spared. Christ had to flee Bethlehem and go into Egypt, fulfilling the scripture, and out of Egypt I shall call my son. But Christ had to flee because Herod was out to kill the Messiah, the king of the Jews. So in that, we learn that in Isaiah, the 11th chapter in the 6th verse, it says, and you should read from the beginning of Isaiah 11 all the way down to the 6th chapter, because it unveils, or it, it reveals um, a lot of the essence of God's deliverers and why they are viewed as a threat to evil rulership. So, um, but uh, it says, and a little child shall lead them. And then remember how Christ, when he would uh, preach to the people and afterwards uh, people would bring their children up because they wanted their children to be touched by the Son of God and be blessed. And the disciples would turn the people away. And then Christ would say to the disciples, suffer the little children and forbid them not, for of such is the kingdom of God. And so children have always been important in the planning and in the orchestration of God's work. 
So as we look at the latter part of our lesson, the baby's cry, uh, here we see that it tells us in verses 5 all the way through 10 of how the baby was sent down the Nile and then uh, the maidens walked along the riverside and they saw the ark. They saw this reed basket uh, that was floating and they fetched it, opened it and saw the child and the baby began to cry. And as the baby began to cry, the maidens, uh, the Pharaoh's daughter, they had compassion for the baby. And then the Pharaoh's daughter said to the nurse of the Hebrew women that she may take the child, speaking now, speaking now to uh, the sibling, speaking to Miriam, Moses' sister, that she could take the child to a Hebrew woman to have the child nursed. And of course, the sister took the child to her mother. And so here we see how God had intervened in and on behalf of the people, even though God was aware of the suffering of the taskmasters and the injustices of the society and the harsh and rigorous work that was piled upon them. God was still moving and intervening in and on behalf of the people. And so I want to also share this uh, with closing. And that is a lot of times when we think of the oppression uh, of different governments and different periods and eras of rulership, uh, a lot of the focus is on the topic of slavery and uh, bondage and being oppressed. And a lot of times, uh, not, not enough focus is on what takes place when a people are taken captive. When families are destabilized and what God has ordained as the family structure, when that member is removed and the family is now without the appointed parent that provides a certain environment to develop the family and grow the family up as a whole unit and not as a unit that has been separated. When this occurs, there is a lot of uh, trauma, there is a lot of disorder, there is chaos, there is uh, uh, destruction of family structure and order and uh, many times the people who are being enslaved and oppressed become predators of themselves because they have not been afforded to lavish and to be enriched and enhanced in the structure that God intended for them to have. And so I just want to... Uh, lists one incident as Moses comes into the knowledge of himself. We are now in the book of Acts, the seventh chapter. This is a part of our de devotional reading. I would like to close our lesson with this. And I'm going to begin it at uh, the 22nd chapter out of the seventh chapter of Acts. And it reads, And Moses was learned in all the wisdom of the Egyptians and was mighty in words and deeds.
Moses had uh, Moses had matriculated through the system and rose to great heights and understood the government of Egypt, understood structure and understood finances and economics and law and order and societal uh, programs. Moses was learned in all the words and deeds of the Egyptians. And it says, now when he was 40 years old, it came into his heart to visit his brethren, the children of Israel. He came unto himself. And seeing one of them suffer wrong, he defended and avenged him who was oppressed and struck down the Egyptian. Seeing one of his brethren, seeing one of his, the Hebrew people, seeing someone like himself being wrongly offended, he avenged the one who had oppressed him, and he struck down the Egyptian. He killed the Egyptian. And look, look at how this unfolds. For he supposed that his brethren would have understood that God would deliver them by his hand, but they did not understand. The next day he appeared to two of them, and they were fighting each other. And he tried to reconcile them, saying, Men, you are brethren. Why do you wrong to one another? But he who did his neighbor wrong, one of the brothers who had engaged and where it says did his brother wrong, uh, we will assume that he instigated or he initiated the fight. And so he turned to Moses and he says, uh, who made you a ruler and a judge over us? And we could uh, maybe revise that in a saying that we probably are more familiar with the wording of, who died and made you king? So the one who was the uh, offender, he said, <clears throat> he pushed his brother away saying, who made you a ruler and a judge over us? Do you want to kill me as you did the Egyptian yesterday? So, the brother, the Hebrew brother that Moses avenged and killed the Egyptian, the word had begun to travel that Moses killed the Egyptian. And uh, he, uh, he's from Egypt. Uh, he's got status in Egypt, but he killed uh, the Egyptian on behalf of the Hebrew. Moses is thinking that they will understand that He's the deliverer, but when he sees two of his brethren killing or fighting each other, and he jumps in to break it apart and try to reconcile their differences, the one who was the offender, he turns to Moses and says, who died and made you king? Now you think you can judge over us. And so, so what you going to do now? You going to kill me like you did the Egyptian yesterday? These are the things that I briefly spoke of as to the damage that is done to a people who are oppressed and enslaved and held against themselves. Their normalcy their natural, their custom traditions, their upbringing falls apart when the family is under attack. So we certainly hope that something that has been said in spite of the 
fall of the structure of the people, God still sent a deliverer and did, in fact, deliver the people from bondage. As always, our prayer is that God keep and God bless you. Amen.